from John 11. John 11, verse 21 through 27. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Thank you. Thank you, Deanne. It's incredibly brave to come up and share your story, and we're thankful for that. Um, I'm thankful because I know that she is not alone in here that uh, many of us, many of you sitting there, you're, you're connecting this because you've experienced the same thing, maybe in a different way, but you have. So today, as we are going to um, preach on the death and the resurrection, I also wanted for you just to see that there are people around you that are living through it as well, and that uh, you should never be alone in your grief. You should find someone here to walk with it, walk with you through that. So before we get into the message, let's take a moment and pray now for, for all of us here. Father, we come and we come to recognize the truth of your word. And we, Lord, we ask that your spirit would stir it in our hearts. And now I want to pray for each one today who is grieving a loss. That, Lord, that you would give them the comfort that only you could give. That you would be present with them. Uh, shield them, Lord. Guide their hearts and minds, protect them, surround them with uh, people who understand and love and can be close. Because, Lord, we know that you know our inmost thoughts. We can't hide from you or shield from you. And so, Lord, I pray we would be honest before you and you would heal and lift us up. In Jesus' name, amen. So thankful for just the, the wonderful people that God has put in this church who share and support each other. And we've had a, a great journey. This is the, the final sermon in the series of the miracles of Jesus. And Jesus' first miracle, he saved a wedding. We remember it was at a, attending a wedding and it was uh, his mother's friend and they ran out of wine and he turned water into wine. Everyone loves that miracle, don't they? It's like a chance to celebrate. It's a happy time. It's a beautiful time. Well, his last miracle is the one we're talking about today. He actually breaks up a funeral. And it wasn't just any funeral. It was the funeral of some of his closest friends, people that he knew well, people that the Bible described that he loved. And he shows up at a funeral, and he breaks it up with a beautiful way. Now, we're going to talk through John chapter 11. So uh, if you have a Bible and you like to follow along, we're going to be jumping in and out of it. Well, we won't read all 44 verses just for the time's sake, but I will just kind of tell the story so we get the pieces through it as we go. And we're going to construct a theology of death that has its beginning point, its turning point, and then its ending. And so we're going to construct that theology of death so that we have something to stand on for ourselves. But we're also going to recognize the pain of it. Because in this story, Jesus, he also wept knowing all that was happening. And so we're going to also recognize and understand that even though we may know the end of death, that doesn't necessarily mean that the, the experience of death now is not going to make us grieve. In fact, it's perfectly normal and natural too. So as we walk through this, let's start in John chapter 1. It just said in John chapter 11, verse 1, it says a certain man was sick. His name was Lazarus. And he tells us that Lazarus was a friend of Jesus, so much so that he says that Jesus loved Lazarus. So there's a few people, I mean, the Bible says God loves everybody, but then in the Bible there's a few people who get named. He loved John, he loved Lazarus, he loved Mary, and he loved Jeff. So those are the ones that get listed. <laughs> everybody else is everybody. Now, in this, he says he loved them, Lazarus. So close friends, he grew up with them. 
Also, he says, Mary and Martha, his sisters. He says, Jesus loved them too. And you would know Mary and Martha from other stories. In fact, after this experience, they throw a dinner for Jesus celebrating. And Mary's the one who does all the work. She's the one who hosts and organizes and prepares. And uh, or Martha's the one who does all that stuff. And then Mary, she's the, uh, the emotional, the one who wants to worship and so she actually does this demonstration of a worship that's beautiful, that, uh, that she cries at his feet and she washes his feet with her hair. And then Jesus says, this is going to be remembered for all time. And so these are people that are very close to Jesus. So he has a connection to them relationally. And it says that he was sick and they sent word to Jesus that he was sick to the point of dying. But when Jesus heard it, he says, this illness will not lead to death. It's for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified. And so Jesus continued where he was, it says, for two more days. So two more days in another city. He just waits. He's teaching, doing what he does. And then finally, he, he tells his disciples, okay, uh, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. And so the disciples, well, good, because if he's sick, sleep is good. He'll get better. That's great. And he's like, no, 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 not that kind of sleep. Lazarus is dead. And so there was a confusion, even with his close disciples, about what we're talking about. Because Jesus says, this sickness doesn't lead to death. And then Jesus says, he's sleeping. And then when they say, so well, what are you saying? He says, well, I mean, he's dead. So they're confused about it. And the reality is we have a lot of confusion and shadow and misunderstanding about death as well. Even though we know that everyone dies. We know that there's no way that that's avoided, that it's... At some point, it happens, but even though we know that it's going to happen and that that is certain, there's still a mystery and a darkness and a shadow about it. And so there's this confusion as they're leading back. And so the disciples were, well, let's go with you, Jesus. Let's all just go die with him. And so what we need to do now is really construct a good understanding of what death is so that we're able to to really understand what's happening here. Genesis chapter 3, verse 3, is our first introduction to death. So it takes you all the way back to the beginning when God created man and woman in the Garden of Eden. And he created everything. He said, it's all good. And he had man and woman in the garden and they were married and they were happy and they were doing what God had put them there to do to take care of the garden. And it even says that, that God would walk with them that he would come and be with them. So imagine that, that uh, strange, beautiful possibility that if God physically was present with you at, at like an appointment every day, hey, we're going to go for a walk with Jesus at 5 o'clock, you know? So that's what's happening in this reality. And so while they're in the garden, the devil asks Eve, is it true that you can do anything you want? She says, well... There's one tree in the middle that God says, don't touch it, don't eat it, or you're going to die. Now, what's interesting is Eve had never seen death. No one's ever died before. So when she is repeating this, saying, if you eat this, if you touch this, you are going to die, she doesn't even have a concept of what death is. It's never happened. It's never been experienced. So what does she know about it? She knows that it's separation from God. Because God has said, don't do this. It will break our relationship. You will be separated from me. Death is the side effect of being separated from God. We understand it and think of it as an end of life here. But in reality, death is just a distance from God. And it began in the first chapters, in the first experience of mankind, that, that people, because of sin, realized that, that we could be separated and far from God. And what happened after that moment? Well, in Genesis chapter 3, verses 16, 17, 18, 19, you see God read out an understanding of what death is. And so they experience death now through animals. Then they receive the curse it says for woman that she will be, have experienced pain and agony in, in, in bearing children and that she will always be at conflict with her husband, with the man. And then the curse to man was that you will work so hard and it will seem to never work. You will toil and sweat just to be existing. 
It says, and in the end, you will die and return to the dust that I made you from. This is what death is. Death is a separation of relationships. Death is the suffering that we feel that, that happens in life. It's the toil, it's the agony, it's the strain. And then ultimately it's this, death is this ending where we seem so far away that someone is gone. All of that became the side effect of being separated from God. And so when Jesus shows up here, at this funeral, Martha says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mary says the exact same thing. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Because they know to be with God is life and to be separated from him is death. And Jesus has held out for a very specific reason. Why is it that he has not yet come back? Jesus could have left when he got news about Lazarus' sickness. He could have walked that very moment to Lazarus and healed him of whatever it was. But it says he waited. Jesus waited two days, and he gives a specific reason. In, in verse 4, he says, For the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified, that he wait. In verse 15, he says, I'm glad for your sake that I was not there so that you might believe. These are strange answers from God, aren't they? In Jesus' timing, in God's timing, he often creates a space for suffering. The prayer of Mary and Martha was, come and heal him. Heal him of the disease. But he didn't. Many of you have prayed that prayer, haven't you? You've prayed for healing and it didn't get answered. You've prayed for healing, whether that's a, a sickness or it's a relationship or it's a, a, a problem in life. And you thought, well, if God could just step in and solve this, then we could be okay. But Jesus purposely waited. Because this suffering, this time of agony, God had a plan for now, it's easy in reading a story to overlook some of the, just the emotional pain that might happen. Think of Mary and Martha taking care of their brother at his bedside while they watch his health just decline rapidly. They're experiencing that. Helpless. There's no real medicine. There's nothing they could do. All they could do is ask Jesus, who they know is the Messiah, who they've watched him heal people. All they could do is say, Jesus, come and save us. Come and heal. He didn't come through. That must have been so disappointing. There must have been so much pain and heartbreak that went a part of that. To be Jesus' best friend that he didn't come and deliver. Jesus says, I did this for something. Now, when God leaves space for suffering, we don't enjoy it. Right? Right? Suffering is suffering. How many of you, your, your parents would say it's character building? My mom would say that. We didn't buy it. But she was right. James chapter 1 verse 2. Count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. To me, that feels like a little bit much from God. Count it joy. How about like just stick in there and don't give up or quit? I, I can accept that. Don't quit when you hit trials. Keep going. Be strong. Be tough. But joy? But that's what he says. Count it all joy. When you meet trials of various kinds, it's not easy. It's miraculous, if anything, for God to put joy in your heart through this suffering. It says, for you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness or patience would be a way you could say it. The testing of your faith produces patience. You don't really know what you believe in and what you stand on until you get tested. How many of you could attest to that? How many of you could agree that it was when I suffered that I really knew God? You would say, it was because of that suffering that I discovered his love for me. It was because of that suffering that I realized my faith is in him. It was that suffering that made me submit myself to know that I can only depend on him. See, 
The testing of your faith brings about patience. And it says that patience or steadfastness has its full effect that you may be perfect and complete. And perfect doesn't mean perfection that you do no wrong. What it means is maturity. These life experiences of of suffering and of, of going through these trials, they bring about a maturity when we come through the other side. So many of you have so much more compassion for others because of the hurt that's happened to you. So many of us are are able to to serve and support and care and give because we've been able to overcome something we thought we could never do. And so the testing of your faith brings that patience. That patience turns into maturity and brings about what God was making in you. And that's why Jesus says, I'm glad for you that I didn't come so that you might believe. You see, Jesus didn't want to heal a sickness of Lazarus because he wanted to show his loved ones and the friends and everyone around there that he had the ability to beat death. He wanted to show them something greater. He wanted them to believe that it was more than just being able to alleviate pain. So death is a separation from God, but life is unity with God. And so if he can bring them to a point of faith, he can unite them with God, and that's where true life would be. But in that moment, as Jesus comes and he approaches this funeral, I want you to see who he was. It says, when Mary came out weeping and those who were mourning with her, The Bible describes it this way. He was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Deeply moved and greatly troubled. Jesus felt the pain of it. John 11, 35, Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible. So concise to show that even though Jesus, 15 minutes later, is going to walk over to the tomb and say, Lazarus, come forth. Even though he knows the outcome, he still in that moment sees the pain and the loss of Mary and Martha and those around, and he had compassion. This is deeply moved. And the same is for you. Grieving is a completely natural and expected response to death. It is not a lack of faith. It shows a depth of love. Jesus didn't say, don't cry, don't do this. You don't have to worry. I'm going to take care of it. He cried with them, even though he knew what he could do. And so three times Jesus cries. This is the first one. He cries at this moment when he sees them. Then on Palm Sunday, which is next Sunday, He has a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It should be a celebration, but he looks back over the city of Jerusalem and he looks back and he cries because he knows Jerusalem doesn't believe in him. In a matter of days, they're going to yell, crucify him. He's a scam. It's a lie. And so his heart breaks because they are going to be separated from God because of their unbelief. And it says he cries. The next time Jesus cries is on Thursday, Maundy Thursday. He walks into the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples. He says, you guys stop here and pray. I'm going to go a little further on my own. And he goes further on his own. And it says he just has an emotional breakdown. He just cries in agony. He says sweat drops of blood. It's, it's an unbelievable display of brokenness and pain when Jesus cries. Because he looks to the cross Not because he's afraid of the physical pain or becoming a martyr or the shame that's going to come along with it, but because he knows he's going to be separated from God. Because you see, on the cross, it wasn't just a tragic event of injustice or unkindness or, or malice. What it was, it was an event in which your sin and my sin was placed on Jesus. And it says the sins of the world were placed on him. And at that time of sacrifice, the world turned dark because it describes that God turned his back on his own son so that he could place the judgment that we deserve on him. And Jesus was in agony thinking of being separated from God. 
Death is the side effect of being separated from God. And it makes Jesus weep to see that. And so, understand that God knows that pain. And as he cried for you, I pray that everyone here would know that Jesus made a sacrifice for your sin. In fact, this is what turns our theology of death. John eleven twenty five, which Deanne read to us. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? That's the question he had for Martha. And that's the question he has for you. Do you believe this? This is the pivotal change in our understanding of what death is. We have to believe that Christ has done this for us. Now, as we make this change, moving from the suffering and pain that came from death, we are now going to look to the hope that comes from Jesus defeating death. All right? Because to be the best, you have to beat the best. Now, how many of you watch the Rocky movies? Rocky three. I need to see hands because I need to find out who doesn't know what I'm talking about when I go back. I'm going to talk for the next 30 minutes about Rocky. So, all right, <laughs> raise your hand. How many of you will watch the Rocky movies? All right, let me see who's with me. How many of you think it's a top 10 movie of all time? <laughs> all right, good, good, good. How many of you own the box set of the VHS or the DVD? Either one's acceptable. All right, best friends. There we go. We got it. Excellent. Good. Now, <clears throat> Rocky three is going to teach us about defeating death in this way. Here we go. Now, Rocky II is awesome. This is where the underdog story, this is where Rocky gets the chance and he beats Apollo Creed and he's the champion. But Rocky III, he's already champion. And now he's made it. He's rich, he's got a house, he's got a family, he's got a Ferrari, he's got life, he's got training. And his trainer, Mickey, greatest trainer of all time, he is setting him up with easy fights, one after the other, one after the other. Easy fights, easy fights, easy fights, so he can keep his championship, so he can stay at the top. But out in the crowd, out in the world, there is Clubber Lang. Clubber Lang played by the great Mr. T, Pastor Mr. T, who's a great man. And he is there, of course, on this day, he's the evil villain. He is mean, he is tough, and he is destroying every opponent that he possibly can, just knocking them out, laying them out. And Mickey doesn't want him to fight because he knows he'll destroy Rocky. But what does Rocky know? He says, to be the champ, you got to beat the champ. And as he sees Mr. T out there as the number one contender, he's like, I have to. If not, I'm a fake champion. I'm a paper champion. I have to do this. So he goes and prepares. Now his training was so weak because he's rich. He's soft. He has what he wants. It's just so lazy. He just thinks he's going to win because he's just going to win. And so he gets ready for the fight and he's not prepared. Worse yet, tragedy on top of that. As he's, before he enters the ring, Mickey has a heart attack right there in the training room. And so you just see Rocky's not ready. He goes in the ring, and in two rounds, he's just beat out and knocked out. He comes back, and his trainer, Mickey, dies from the heart attack. So he lost his fight. He lost his title. He lost his trainer that he loves. He's lost everything, and this is the part of the movie that's just sad. Sad violin parts the whole way through. He experienced the grief, the loss. But his good friend Apollo Creed, who we beat in Rocky II, he comes back and he says, I know you've got more in you than that. I know you could do it. And so now begins the training. Now he starts to work with him, and he starts to train. But his heart's not in it. He's not the eye of the tiger anymore. He's running on the beach and he's losing and he quits and he stops there and he's just all in his emotions and feelings and Adrian comes. It's a good wife, right? She comes and she presses into his heart and she tries to find the truth in him and she says, I believe in you, Apollo believes in you, but you've got to believe in you. It's a good scream moment there. That's the part where you cried in the movie, right? So from this point, then Rocky's ready. 
He searched himself. He's found himself. He believes now. And so he gets going. The training begins. Training montage after training montage, right? The best part of the movie. How many of you watch Rocky and then afterwards you go ahead and you start, you know, you set up a whole, you know, routine for it? <laughs> right? Emmanuel does. He's ready. Go ahead, Emmanuel. Get it going. So he starts training. So now one after another, fight, 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 get ready, get ready, get ready. He does all these awesome things. And he is prepared now to get the ring. He has the eye of the tiger. He's ready. He gets into that ring and he's got a plan. He has a strategy that he's going to let Mr. T punch him in the face as many times as he can. This is a brilliant strategy. Not many people do this. But he just takes the beating, takes the suffering, keeps getting hit, but he knows he's never going to quit. And so at the end, after he's worn him down and exhausted, he finally fights back and knocks Mr. T out. And then he gets to stand up and go, Adrian, I did it! Right? <laughs> Greatest of all time. Greatest ever. So what we learn from this, the reason you should have Rocky Three on your weekly streaming is because we learned that to beat the champ, you have to beat the champ. To be the man, you've got to beat the man. You have to take out the biggest opponent or it's not real. And so Jesus performed miracle after miracle he could feed people, but you're going to be hungry again. If he gives the blind man sight, the blind man still dies one day. If he heals a leper, the leper's healed for now, but something else will kill him later. You see, all of these things that Jesus has shown them, they're good things. They're, they're alleviations of pain. They show miraculous power. But if in the end, Jesus doesn't beat death, they all still just die. You have to beat the undefeated death in order for this to mean anything. You see, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17 shows us this. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, useless, and you're still in your sins. Think of that. The very core of our faith is that Jesus died and rose again. If he can't beat death, nothing else really matters, does it? You see, if you adopt Christianity because it's a good ethical way to live, what happens when you die? You're still dead. There's many good ethical choices you can pick. Pick any religious and take the best out of them, and you can live ethically. But that's not what it is. If it's just about good community and bonding and friendship and something to do, what happens when you die? Friends don't go. Death becomes the end. If your life is just getting better, no matter how good you get, you face death. If your life is about accomplishments, a bucket list, things to do before you die, you still die. You see, there is one undefeated opponent that if Jesus doesn't take that out, all of this becomes useless. Coming to church is just weird if there's no eternal life. Because your faith is built on the idea that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and that he rose again. And that because he rose again, you have eternal life. It's so easy for us to forget about eternal life because we want to improve this life. That's why we need to avoid suffering because we want a good life. So don't suffer, accumulate, improve but we realize that these points of crisis, when we face death, that all of that was insignificant compared to knowing what eternal life is. You know when we really think of eternal life? When you attend a funeral, right? That's the only time I think of it. In fact, in the book of Ecclesiastes, where we're told good wisdom is that it's better to attend a funeral than a party. Because in a party, we forget life, and we enjoy, and things happen, and it's great. But when you go to a funeral, you realize, what is the meaning of life? What comes after this? You know, it's been so rewarding or encouraging or, 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 or a great reminder to be a part of a church where we have funerals for each other. 
I can still remember a year ago attending Rick Blackwood's funeral at Christ Fellowship and seeing a church full of people grateful for the life. I can still remember Jackie Eads' funeral, a lady who prayed for everyone and served everyone. Such a wonderful life to celebrate. Why was it wonderful to celebrate? Because whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. It's a beautiful celebration of life when you know that there is eternal life. When you're able to stand at that moment in that funeral and say, Jesus has defeated death. This loss is temporary. First Thessalonians says, we don't mourn like others who have no hope, but we have hope in eternal life. The resurrection is the single most important point of your faith. And so in this story, when he goes to Lazarus, Jesus, after he weeps with Mary, he says, show me where he's laid. And they walk him over to the tomb and they says, but wait, he's been dead four days. He stinks. He's already begun to decompose. Jesus is showing off here. He's like, I raised in three days. I'll wait an extra day and I'll show you that Lazarus is really dead. That this is a time that I'm going to do something phenomenal. And he just yells, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus walks out. Can you imagine being in that spot? Like it's even hard to just say out loud that someone raised from dead. You can't picture, you can't walk to the funeral home over here on 8th Street and imagine someone calling a name and then coming out of one of those catacomb type things. It's preposterous. We can't even wrap our head around it. Can you imagine Mary and Martha and all their friends sitting there like, oh, no one wouldn't say anything. He smells really bad right now. And he just walks out. God is flexing, displaying his power over death. Because to be the champ, you have to beat the champ. If God does not kill death, then we have a useless faith. And so Jesus demonstrates it with Lazarus so they would believe with him. And then he demonstrates it through his own life so that he could be our substitute for judgment and our redeemer for eternal life. And this is where our theology of death comes to a close. Revelation chapter 21. You see, the entire Bible is an encapsulating understanding of this eternal life. It begins in Genesis where death enters and the separation of God. It's focused on Christ who brings the redemption and then it shows us the end. And Revelation 21 says, he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain. All these former things are passed away. Every side effect of sin, death, sadness, pain, all this brokenness, he makes a new world. So then death was undefeated until Jesus walked out of that grave. And now... We see from 1 Corinthians that death is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Today, I just want that to be immensely clear to you. That you have victory over death because of Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you had any doubt of that, I want you to rest on the scripture of the word of God that Jesus Christ has died for your sins and taken them from you. There's nothing else you owe God anymore. There's nothing you need to be ashamed before God. He has freed you and forgiven you. And now there's nothing you need to do for God for him to love you, that he has already loved you and he has already bought you. Simply receive the gift of eternal life from him. As John 25 says, whoever believes, even though he dies, he will live.
do you believe this? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for how beautifully you construct your word to teach us these things. How you allowed Mary and Martha go through that pain of loss so that we could read and believe in you and know your strength and power. God, I know today in this room, so many have grieved a loss in the last year, two years, or even how long. It's not like it goes away. God, you sit with them in that grief and you understand it's, it's a pain. So God, I pray that in that grief, you could remind us of eternal life. Remind us of the hope that's in you. Strengthen our faith and our resolve. Lord, give us each other for comfort. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As victors in Christ, let's stand.